dear Rafa. Hello. I'm I'm sorry. I think this is uh, a, a, a. I've left this a little late. We were supposed to be. I was supposed to send you a new video on Monday, and now it's Thursday. Uh, in order for you to have time to think about uh, whatever I'm proposing, uh, so that Saturday's uh, discussion can be more fruitful, uh, certainly for you. Um, and here I am, uh, and must summon my thoughts as best I can, uh, rather at the last minute. I remember quite distinctly one thing, uh, that at the end of our tutorial on Saturday last week, uh, I had ended up, we had ended up, with the thought in my mind, uh, what is it that is theatrical? Uh, the occasion for this being my having described to you uh, the process whereby uh, the director of another of my plays wrote to me anxiously uh, complaining that uh, he had never directed a love story before. Sounded totally implausible to me, but so he said, and he wished he were directing a play as it might be featuring uh, a midget in a cat suit reciting Spinoza. Uh, my director was a philosophically minded fellow, and I wasn't entirely surprised by this. Then it occurred to me that in that case, that's what I should write for him. And uh, many people who hadn't spent perhaps as much time as I had until then uh, writing stories, commercially obliged to write stories, um, might have thought, oh, <laughs> I don't think that's going to go anywhere. How, that's never going to fly. And maybe they w wouldn't have even occurred to them in the first place. But for me, it did because uh, what I wanted from a premise would be that it would undo uh, any possibility of thinking it through, uh, so as to allow the premise to express itself, to find its own path, uh, as all premises should, at least in the creation of fiction. So I was delighted by this thought. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> where could that possibly lead? Um, so I set out and, as I think I described to you uh, in our uh, tutorial, if not in the previous video, uh, I wound up with uh, not an actual midget, not a, a, an actor uh, of restricted growth uh, in a cat suit, but a, a, a perfectly sized a normally sized, perfectly, it's the wrong word, uh, a normally, a typically sized human being, a, a actor in a cat suit. Um, his name, however, was Midget, uh, uh, or Midget. Sir Arthur Midget, I made him, M-I-D-G-E-T-T-E, -E, a French name, a real French name, from the Limousin reason, region, which uh, gave him a background and gave me uh, something to enrich the premise, and there he is um, rehearsing a lecture. He's a Spinoza expert. Uh, he's re rehearsing a lecture that he will shortly be giving uh, while waiting to go on stage as the cat in a famous pantomime, uh, the, the uh, uh, winter uh, vaudevilles that are part of the English theatrical tradition. Um, many plays that are performed year after year and feature celebrities. Uh, usually that's part of what draws an audience uh, to these uh, festive events in the theatre. And one of those plays is called Dick Whittington's Cat, or Dick Whittington and His Wonderful Cat. Um, a story of Dick, uh, supposedly a real person, became a Lord Mayor of London and his cat uh, sent all the rats of London packing, supposedly. However, there are many other uh, characters, stock characters, usually the same ones, over and over in different plays, uh, that flesh out this maybe somewhat historical tale. So Sir Arthur, uh, in his cat suit, is about to go on stage as the cat, um, and then, um, and meanwhile, he's rehearsing his, his Spinoza lecture to the annoyance of his fellow actors. And when he does go on, he very swiftly removes his cat suit to reveal a British Army uniform, circa 1945, uh, and, uh, and a British Army accent, and uh, shadows uh, like uh, the bars of a prison appear, as does a figure in a white uniform who turns out to be none other than Hermann Goering, 
uh, during the Nuremberg trials uh, in which he is going to be sentenced to death as he fears and he's asking his jailer who uh, until a moment before uh, was a man called Sir Arthur Midget wearing a cat suit um, whether the jailer could find him uh, some convenient exit from this world some cyanide um, and so the the story to my own amazement had jumped into enti an entirely different time frame it jumped backwards uh, uh, 50 60 years in time and uh, and so it proceeded I had no idea uh, what kind of a merry dance it was leading me but the man who began as Sir Arthur Midget and went on immediately to become an English uh, soldier because the cat suit uh, hid this wonderfully and provided a, a delicious transformation uh, this character had turned out to be present in almost every scene um, eventually surfacing as God uh, leaving the main character who is in fact Spinoza Spinoza still alive in 1945 to his own great distress he wants out uh, any way he can find out and Hitler certainly going to be providing him with one um, it serves as a bewilderment for the character of Spinoza who starts going up to almost everybody and saying are you God <laughs> because of course everybody is perhaps so I got myself into some strange uh, country uh, thanks to not having any baggage to declare when I went into it no ideas about where it was going few people perhaps unless they had spent as I had 50 years uh, inventing stories for money um, but inventing them nonetheless could perhaps have gone as naked into uh, the jungle of that title as I did having experienced uh, nothing but the joy of the companionship of the story the emerging story itself which was leading me by the hand and telling me where to go not everyone discovers this perhaps they just don't go on writing long enough until they break through the delusion that as a writer you are telling a story and discover that you are actually being told and it's a wonderful discovery and then you're no longer responsible for the rubbish you write which oddly enough turns out to be much more like something uh, distinctively your own than any of the ideas you yourself have independently of what would be the kind of story you might write so uh, I was imagining for the sake of it where I stood on the precipice of writing this uh, bizarre uh, premise turning this bizarre premise into a play as the question was where did it now go the one thing I knew obviously was that it had to be theatrical and that's uh, in a sense another way of of looking at uh, the question that I raise in the title of this uh, uh, a journey of ours a search for the meaning uh, of theatre in other words of what is theatrical it's it's a perilous word uh, theatrical is rarely used except literally uh, of a theatre event unless it's used of a person who is overly histrionic a theatrical person a diva a poser it's not a complimentary word although to be around theatrical people could be more entertaining than to be around people with no gift uh, uh, for poses no gift for the exaggerated um, but interestingly as much as it's uh, become uh, a disparaging word once it's taken out of the theatre itself once it's inside the theatre it asks much more sternly so what is theatrical um, I had uh, uh, I suppose a lifetime's uh, thinking writing pieces uh, for the theatre and seeing them uh, as, as many of us who love the theatre have uh, a, a long history of, uh, of, of seeing what is theatrical even if we're not gauging it precisely as that and if we go and see um, something like the musical Miss Saigon from some years ago where a helicopter landed I, I don't know how much of a real helicopter it was but it obviously appeared to be a real helicopter landing uh, on the stage I imagine because I never saw it to simulate the terrible departure of the last desperate uh, refugees fleeing uh, Saigon and clinging to the 
uh, the the helicopter. I don't know how they managed to uh, convey that lift off if they did, but uh, th that in a sense might be regarded as not theatrical. It's literal, um, a literal uh, you know a, a helicopter, whereas. Um, many theatrical plays would have rendered the idea of a helicopter entirely by using the human body and maybe a couple of chairs. And I've seen uh, wonderful plays in which four chairs uh, made a car, made an unforgettable car, uh, much uh, more evocative, much more suggestive, much more full of meaning than a real car on stage. Although I, I have written a play in which a real car appears on stage. It sits there. It is the vehicle for the play. But in its contradictoriness, because one should not be looking at metal and machinery on stage. The stage is a place that doesn't need metal or machinery. Uh, it needs a human story. It needs an absolute minimum. Uh, light, perhaps, uh, a body, surely, uh, a voice, surely, although exceptions to all those rules. Nonetheless, uh, that is what we attend to. We attend to something, whatever it might be, so essential about the human spirit that to, um, I don't know, traipse machinery across the, the stage, is, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it actually seems counterproductive to me as an old theatre hand. But of course, we who live in the age of, uh, of cinema uh, think rather differently because we long for spectacular show. Um, we don't long for it once the show is just uh, just features people and words and ideas and emotions and confrontations. It never occurs to us to want uh, real engines on stage. It's even something of a shock when you get a glimpse of uh, what came into the theatre in 1660 or so, uh, with restoration uh, comedy on the English stage, magnificent representations of of houses, uh, both indoors and out, something that had not been featured in the 17th century, although it, it slowly moved towards that stage. But it was coming from the Shakespearean stage, which relied, much like the Greek, uh, simply on, uh, on bodies, on language, uh, on on the claim that we were uh, in Greece or in the Forest of Arden or wherever it might be was sufficient to trigger in us, OK, there we are, tell us a story now. And using minimum props, using the background, the perennial thing, a house, useful for its balcony, for its downstairs uh, opening of a curtain to reveal an indoor world, which then spilled out onto the four stage that was the stage we were looking at, which then could contain the entire world emanating from the womb of a room. Um, and that worked perfectly. So uh, with the, the 17th century, uh, the, the late 17th century, once we were uh, uh, had put an end to the Puritan Revolution in Britain, which wanted nothing of theatre at all in any form. So we, in our um, reaction to this, decided to put enormous amounts of entertaining uh, substances uh, and, and fronts uh, onto the stage, just as at that moment in the British theatre, although it was already well established in France, uh, women were were allowed actually to act the part of women, shock horror, uh, which had always been rather wonderfully done by boys who were extremely good. This much uh, we know from the detail of which we are told, extremely good at evoking uh, women. And there, you know, we're only a step away uh, from the Greek world in which the actor who had just come on in a mask playing a man, came on now in a different mask, playing a woman. Because the point was not the physical appearance, uh, maybe just one, one uh, essential element of that character would be incarnated in the mask. The rest would be spoken. The rest would be action and speech. Um, and we've moved steadily away from that while still searching for the theatrical. And so uh, I've, I've reached 15 minutes <laughs> All too easily. And I'm going to shut this down uh, with a fond farewell 
and re-emerge almost immediately to pursue a little more about this matter of the theatrical. Thank you and be well. It's snowing here. It's going to snow for 48 hours. Uh, if that's so where you are, uh, then be well. I know it's not where Rava is uh, in her Hawaiian uh, refuge. A wonderful place to be. Speak soon. Bye.